Okay, people hear me in back? Top row? All the way in the back? All right, thank you. It's good to be back. Um, okay, so today we're gonna talk about a new type of data that we can work with in Java. Um, and this is going to ease us into a topic that is going to later consume us for a good part of the second third of the semester, which is talking about Java objects. This is, Java objects will represent not only a dramatically new programming style for you all to learn, but a real enriching of our ability to work with data. So that's really what objects are for. We're gonna see the first example of a Java object today, although this is a very special Java object that has a couple of kinks to it. There's a couple things about working with text, because text is so important to us humans that are a little bit different in Java. Um, but that's what we're gonna do today. So the first thing I wanna do is uh, give a big thank you to Ben, who is here on Monday, uh, filling in for me, so. Um, Uh-oh, we're, do we're doing that again, okay. Let's see how long that lasts. Um, okay, any questions about the material that we covered on Monday? I know I wasn't here. Um, I listened to the class and I feel like Ben did a fantastic job, but any questions as we get started today? Functions will be our topic uh, on the homework problems this week, um, leading up to you guys having a chance to work uh, with them on next week's quiz. So one of the things I wanna point out about our homework problems is that, you know, one of the challenges with Java as an introductory language is we have to attach some training wheels early on in the process. So for the first week or two, you guys wrote snippets of code um, where, you know, Sometimes we had declared some variables for you and you were just supposed to use them. Now, we are having you write complete functions, okay? So that's our next step, is uh, having you write entire functions. Eventually, you're actually gonna be working with the entire object, which is really how Java thinks about your code. But for now, we've taken off one set of training wheels. And this is usually a little confusing to people as we get started, um, but within a couple weeks, we'll be working with entire, you'll be designing entire Java objects, and we won't have to worry about this anymore. We'll have taken off all the training wheels. But for now, going forward, what you should expect to see um, in class more often uh, on the homework problems, definitely, is us asking you to write a function, a function that does some specific thing that's gonna contain a snippet of code similar to what you were writing before. Okay, so, so let's talk now about this again, this dramatic expansion of the kind of data we've been able to work with. So, so far, we've talked about processing, storing, manipulating data using Java's eight, Java's eight primitive data types, right? Uh, integers, floating point numbers, and characters. Uh, we've talked about using arrays of these as well. So we talked about that last week. So now we can use uh, one uh, of these, uh, you know, one integer, one floating point number, that's not very interesting. There's not much in the world that you can really accurately describe with a single number. So we expanded ourselves to being able to work with entire sequences, lists, arrays of these types of data. And up until now, we've been working mainly with numbers, but text is a really important component of the world around us, right? Um, so one of the big missing pieces, and again, this is such an important type of data to work with that Java makes some exceptions for it when you work in the Java programming language. And this is not uh, unique to Java. Other languages also sometimes treat text specially because it's so important, right? Because without text, we can't represent uh, great works of fiction. This is a uh, famous book by an author who grew up around here, actually. Um, you can't represent all of the human communication that's going on in the world, right? Um, so, you know, a fair amount of, you think about the data that you as a human being generate every day. A fair amount of that is text, your communications with other people, right? Written communication. Um, you know, I think one of the more, more interesting things, looking back on sort of my several decades in technology, um, is sort of the explosion of text messaging and textual basis, uh, different ways to communicate uh, through text. There was a period of time, and again, it was before a lot of you were conscious, um, but there was a period of time where a lot of people thought, well, you know, voice is gonna take over. You know, pretty soon, 
we'll all be, you know, video chatting and, you know, calling each other all the time and stuff like that. Um, but I actually, I, I suspect that within your lifetimes, when you were very young, uh, the amount of text communication between people has actually skyrocketed, right? I mean, it's about as easy to make a phone call as it was 20 years ago. Um, but it's gotten way easier to send small pieces of text around, whether that's through, you know, um, through a texting application or a chat application on Slack, whatever, right? Uh, so this is actually kind of an interesting, um, you know, a surprise, right, that technology brought us, right? People actually really like to communicate via text, right? Um, and I think there's some, some deep reasons for this. Um, and then there's also lots of places in the world where text is a stand-in for some other type of identifier, right? So license plate numbers are a great example. Here's an example where, you know, what I really need is some kind of ID. I just need a unique way to identify this plate, which is then supposed to identify that vehicle, okay? It doesn't have to be text. It could have been, like, a picture or a barcode or something like that, but because humans work with text so much, this is something that we'll remember, right? You know, if you saw, you know, an accident or something like that and the car sped off and what was on the back was a barcode, it would be difficult to tell uh, the police person what you saw. But if you see text, you're more likely to remember, right? And that's also why we're still stuck with, with passwords, right? Or passphrases or however you guys do it today. Same thing. Humans are good at remembering text. Um, not as good at remembering sequences of numbers. Okay, so a lot of the interesting data in our world is in this form, this textual form. Now, as a computer scientist, you call this a string. That's just the term you use. I can't remember, I mean, at some point before I became a computer scientist and it totally changed my brain, I think I probably referred to text in some other way, words, whatever, but now you call them strings. Right? That's the word for a piece of computer data that consists of a series of characters. Okay? Um, this is, you know, again, and I can't remember not knowing this, right? I mean, I've always been referring to these things as strings. So in Java, there is a way to work with strings. Now, there's a couple of things on this slide that are, should be disturbing to you, okay? Because there's some new, new things here, right? There's a type in Java for working with series of characters. Actually, there's already a type in Java for working with a series of characters. What is that type? We've already talked about this. So that's the first thing that should be disturbing to you. I already know how to work with a series of characters. If I want to store a series of characters in my program and do something with it, what do I do? You guys already know this. Like, this is something that we don't even need this new type, right? How would I do this before right now? Yeah. Yeah, why not just use an array of characters, right? I already, I already have this, right? I don't, I, so, so that should be the first thing that should worry you about this is why, right? There's no special type in Java for a series of integers. Okay, so that's curious, right? Seems like there's some redundancy here, right? I already have a way to work with text, right? I told you before I could store the entire, you know, um, you know, record of uh, congressional setting is just one big long array of characters and then I could do whatever I want with it, okay? So, so Java actually has a special type. What else is worrying about this? What's different about this type from the ones that we've seen already? Something that's evident from this slide. Yeah. What's that? Oh, I like, there's two answers here. Okay, so it uses double quotes. Yeah, okay, so that, actually, that was really good. I even forgot this, right? So I have literal values here that I'm using as part of an assignment to a variable. Before, when I worked with text, I was working with single characters, and in Java, if I want a single character or little, I use single quotes. If I use double quotes, I get a string. So that's, that's interesting. It means that somehow, Java has sort of built-in support for this type of, of data. Somebody else also had an answer that I liked. Can the person who was vaguely off in that direction repeat their answer? What else is different about this type? You can see from the slide. So there's a new way to declare literals. What else? Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. So the nanotypes we've seen before, right? Let me back up a few slides uh, and show you this list that we had before. Bite short, int long, float double care, car. Someone was, I, okay, so let's take a vote. How many people would like me to say that as car? I, I really do want your opinion here. Car? Care. Oh, sorry guys, I think the cares have it. The, the people that approached me were car partisans, but I think the cares win the day. Um, all right, and, and then booleans, right? These types all were denoted by single case letters, and now I've got this thing called a string, it's capital. And that turns out to be important. Okay, but, but on some level, if we squint at this, it looks like one of the other types of data that we've been able to work with so far. Okay, so what am I doing on line one? I'm declaring a new variable called maybe. It's of type string. It's just like I declared a variable to store an int or a boolean. Lines two and three show me assigning and then reassigning the value of maybe. So on the first uh, line, I assign it to challenge. Um, now I see here a string literal. So on the right side is a literal value. It's not a variable. It's a specific string that appears in my code, and I've enclosed it in double quotes. I'm assigning it to maybe. So after line two executes, maybe now has the value of challenge. I don't like, so we're gonna change that uh, to Jeff on line three. That's just reassignment. Again, this is identical to what we've seen already. And then on line four, I'm calling a function, right? I don't know what that function does, uh, but that's a, that looks like a function call to me. The function is called call me, and the variable is called maybe. The variable is implied. It's a function that takes a single argument. Okay. So, strings look familiar, but strings start to behave differently. Strings have some new features, all right? So let me show you one. Right, so I've got a, you know, I've, I've got a string variable here on line one. And let's just comment out this last one for now, okay? So this looks similar, similar to something that I saw before. What was that? Who can remind me? There was something else I've worked with in Java that had a length, a way to get its length. Yeah, an array. Right? But it's a little different, okay? And this difference is gonna, I'm, I guarantee, this difference is gonna, um, is gonna catch you up. So let's try this. Array is equal to, oh. Let's declare an int array with length nine, a care array, sorry. And then let's print its length. Oh, okay, sorry. Care array, there we go. What's different about this? Again, this is one of those places where Java is gonna mess with you. And everyone, someone asks every semester, why is this the case? And the answer is, I have no idea, right? Some programmer made this decision. And if you go find that person, you can complain to them. We're just stuck with it for now. What's different about these two? Yeah, way in the back. Yeah, I have, um, if I wanted to get the length of an array, the magic that we used was dot and then the name of this special property called length, right? Right here, that works. If I wanna get the length of a string, I do something very similar, except I have to tack on these, this pair of parentheses. So what does that make the length look like for a string? Should be review for Monday. It looks a little bit like I'm doing what? Yeah. Sort of looks like I'm calling a function, yeah. Like, I could put stuff in here, you know, I could pass it an argument. Now, it doesn't take any arguments, so if I do that, I'm gonna get a compiler error, but this, start, this looks like a function call, okay? And then it turns out that not only can I get, so with arrays, all I can do is access their length. That's the only special feature that they have. With a string, it turns out that there's a bunch of things that strings can do. Once I have a string variable, there's a number of different things that variable knows how to do. It comes with these special features. So for example, you guys, some of you don't know anything about this yet, that's totally fine. But let's just use our powers of intuition to try to figure out what's going on here. So on line three, 
I print the length of the string. Okay, that, that looks a lot like what I did for an array. Wh who wants to give me a hypothesis about what's happening on line four? Just walk me through that. What do you think? Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm testing. This is a way of examining. I'm basically asking Java to tell me whether or not this variable stored in, whatever string is stored in the variable password is equal to, in this case, a string literal. Right? So I, and, and this is something that looks now even more like a function call because I'm passing an argument. So somehow I'm, I'm, use, I'm starting with a variable, I, mean, I have a dot, then I'm following that with something that looks like a function call, and I'm passing it some data. So what could I put in here? that would cause that to be true. Right now it's false, right? And that's consistent with our suspicion that this is a way of comparing two strings to see if they're the same. So what would I do here to examine that hypothesis further? Yeah. Ziz, but yes, yeah. Pronounce ziz. Perfect, exactly. So now it's true. Okay, so now I have another piece of data here, right? So that looks like it's doing what I think it should do. Let's make a tiny little change here to ziz cat and see, now it's false, okay? So apparently this also examines the case of each letter, whether it's upper or lower case. Okay, so one of the reasons we, well, I mean, there's a bunch of reasons we talk about strings. One is that they're fascinating and text data is super interesting, but they're also our first example of a Java object. And strings are kind of an interesting Java object. They sort of sneak up on you. Um, Java in general, as a language, I would argue, is highly consistent, almost to a fault. There are places where Java would be easier to use if it was less consistent. But it strives for this high level of consistency, and that sometimes forces you to do things that are pretty dumb. This is like the one place as far as I can tell, I'm sure there are a few others, but this is one of the first places where you see Java display a little bit of flexibility. You can almost imagine the people that design this language having arguments about this, right? Well, strings are objects, but we should allow them to be assigned with literals. I'll explain what this means. You know, this is a place where we're blending the world of primitive types and objects, okay? We are gonna talk a lot more about objects, but, in general, an object is a programming technique that allows us to combine both state and behavior. So this brings together two of the things we've already talked about in this class. We've been working with variables. So we've been taking a variable and we've been assigning it a value. At that point, that variable has state. It knows what the value that I last assigned to it is. Last time, we talked about functions. Functions give me a way to take a single piece of logic about how to perform some computation, in many cases, an algorithm for solving a problem, and wrapping up in a nice, tidy package that I can then use and reuse throughout my code. Objects bring those two things together. So if we go back and look at our example again, the, the variable password, right? Password clearly knows two things. In order to complete this function call, this method call, password has to know two things. The first thing it has to know is, what's my value? What are the, the series of characters that you stored, that you last stored as my contents, right? So, straight, so password has to remember that I assigned this variable to it, this literal to it, this cat. So it has to know that sequence of characters. But then it also has to know something else. It has to know how to compare itself to another string. There's an algorithm. We could go through that algorithm if you want. Uh, maybe, uh, maybe I'll write a new homework problem and post it for you guys. It's not hard. There's an algorithm for determining whether or not two strings are equal. And the password also knows how to do that. So we're bringing together, again, once I declare a string variable, not only do I get to use it to save some information, but I get all of these cool features that come along with it, and I'll show you uh, a bunch of them in a minute. Okay. 
So again, just to reiterate, we will talk about this more in a couple weeks. Every string has state. That's the sequence of characters that were stored, last stored in that variable. It's an array of characters. It also has behavior. These are functions that we can call that operate on its state or use its state. So when I call it equals, that function uses the data that I've stored inside the variable and whatever string I pass to compare it against to decide if the two strings are equal. All right, so when we think about objects, we're always gonna come back to these two questions. What data does it store? And then what are the things that it then allows me to do? What are the algorithms that I can then uh, use it to help me uh, with? Or what, is it, what are the things it knows uh, how to accomplish? Okay. Let me just, you know, kind of go, go through this. So, uh, and, and reiterate a little bit so you help understand the distinction, right? So primitives in Java store one value, right? So these primitive types, one value, or if I create an array of them, a sequence of values, a series of values of the same type. In Java, primitive types have names that start with the lowercase letter. And there's only eight of them, so you can actually memorize all of them if you want, if you think that will impress somebody. Uh, maybe a recruiter or something. Um, objects, on the other hand, can be made up of mixtures of both primitive types and other objects. So once we start talking about objects, and we're not gonna do that fully today, but once we get there, which we will soon, this will allow us essentially to represent any type of data that we can represent as a mixture of primitive types. So pretty much once we open up objects, we can now represent any kind of data that you'd ever want to work with. If you can represent it in numerical form, if you can digitize it, which you have to do in order for the computer to be able to work with it, you can create an object in Java that represents it. Objects have names that start with a capital letter. This is a convention in Java, but it's important because it allows you to identify them. So when you see a type that starts with an uppercase letter, you know you're dealing with a Java object as opposed to a primitive type. So we're, again, we're gonna give you lots and lots and lots of practice. We spent like a whole month going over this together. But for now, we're gonna use strings as our entry point to the world of objects. Okay, however, I told you that strings have some weird, uh, there's some weird accommodations that Java has made for strings. Okay, strings are, are special, right? They get a little bit of special treatment in the language. So here's one. Normally, to create a Java object, we always use the new keyword. You guys will get familiar with this. Where have you seen the new keyword before? Yeah. Yeah, when initializing an array, right? So we saw the new keyword when I set up an array. Arrays in Java, it turns out, are also objects. They don't have very many interesting properties, just that length property, but they're also internally objects. But this would be normally how we would talk about initializing strings. And when we initialize other Java objects, this is how we're gonna do it, and we're gonna talk more about what's happening here later. But with strings, essentially the way this, and this works, by the way, you can do this in Java. So for example, I can say, here's my variable declaration. I'm saying, hey Java, I wanna create a string variable called my string. And then on the right, I'm initializing that variable. I'm saying, create a new string, and then inside those parentheses in something that looks, again, like a function call, because it is a function call, which we will talk about a little bit later, I pass a string literal. So I'm saying I want the contents of this string variable to be the letters A, B, C. On the second line, I'm creating another string, a string variable, whose contents are D, E, F. So I can do this. You can create Java strings in this way. But because strings get this special treatment in the language, because we work with them so often, Java allows you to create them using this shorthand. So I can create a string literal by just enclosing the sequence of characters in double quotes. Again, there's no other type of data in Java except for one really weird case that I'm not gonna talk about that gets this type of treatment, all right? So these are equivalent. There are no other Java objects that you can create without using the word new. Now, it also turns out, and I will be happy to uh, 
uh, help you guys investigate this on the forum if you want, that there is a tiny difference between these two ways of creating strings. Um, a tiny but sometimes meaningful difference. So if, again, if you guys want to ask about this on the forum, I'll be happy to talk about it with you. It's actually kind of interesting if you're interested in sort of how Java works under the hood. But to us, we don't, it's not going to bother us. These are, we're going to consider these two to be equivalent. And normally, we're just going to, you know, this is how we're going to initialize our strings. You know, Java has this way of doing it. Why not use it? So Java is also the only object type in Java that supports a literal. So again, I can assign a Java object. The reason why this works is because I can actually use a string, a sequence of characters inside double quotes as a literal in an assignment. And again, there are two types of object in Java that allow you to do this, and the other one is something that never comes up in this class. So this is the, so here, this is now a string literal. It's an object value that appears in my code. Like I said before, this distinction is gonna trip you up, so be very careful here. Single quotes in Java always get you a character. You cannot put more than one character inside single quotes. Double quotes get you a string. You can put zero characters inside a string, or one, or 10, or 100. If you try to initialize, most of the time the compiler will catch this for you, but there are times uh, when this can be confusing, right? So just be careful. Right? Most of the time in Java, you want to use double quotes. Single quotes are rare that you're going to need those. Okay. So just to point out again, you know, we've seen this new syntax before. We did it when we used arrays. And the reason that we needed new then is because arrays in Java are also objects. I didn't want to talk about that then, so we didn't bring it up. But now we're starting to dip our toe into the world of objects, and so we need to talk about it. Okay. Another bit of special treatment that strings get in the language is that there's a special operator for combining them together. Okay, so if I want to combine two strings in Java, I can use a plus operator. If I have two string variables, and I want to concatenate them. So this, there's no meaningful combination of com meaning to combine them, right? What I'm doing is I'm appending them. So full is going to contain all the contents of first, my first name, plus a space, that's the string literal, in between the two variables, plus all the contents of last. So when we're done, it's gonna contain my full name. Again, this is the only place in Java where the language bends over backwards to accommodate uh, you using a particular kind of object. All right. So let's, let's do some stuff with strings, or with strings, right? So I promised that I could concatenate things together, so let's see what the output of this is, okay? So it's clear that both of these methods work, right? I can change this to new string def, and it's still going to work. I can change this to just do an assignment through a literal. I can change this to also do an assignment through a literal. Great. All right, so these both work fine. And again, this is the, this is the style that we'll typically use and expect you to use on homework problems and in class. Um, I can, you know, put anything I want in between these guys. I can use the same variable twice um, in my concatenation, whatever, right? Plus is the only operator that works here. Minus doesn't really make sense, right? Times, you know, plus is the only operator that really has a meaningful um, role when I'm working with strings. Okay. So I told you that strings contain both state and, um, you know, basically combined aspects of both variables and functions. You know, state and, uh, you know, data and capabilities. So how do I get at those features? How do I get at those methods that a string comes along with? And to do that, I use something called dot notation. Again, this is just syntax. There's nothing magical about it. It just happens to be how Java does this. A lot of other languages have actually adopted dot notation, so this is pretty common. I think Python uses it. JavaScript uses it. I think Go uses it. 
don't know about Rust or Haskell or whatever, but this is not uncommon uh, as a way to access a, um, a feature, uh, some property of an object, right? Whether it's a, a, a property or a method. And so here's a couple examples of me using these built-in features of a string, okay? So we already talked about line two. That's the way that I get the length of a string, and that's useful a lot of times when I'm working with data and strings, because just like an array, a lot of times when I work with a string, I wanna go through it character by character and do something. What do we think is happening on line three? Again, you guys, I don't expect you to know what these are. I'm just expecting you to think, right, and read, okay? And think about this is text data, right? So who wants to give me a hypothesis about what line three will do. Yeah. Yeah, so I have a hypothesis that that's gonna take the string, and it's gonna replace T, lowercase t, with a lowercase b. Okay, I think that's reasonable. We'll test that in a minute. What about the, uh, fourth line? Anyone want to speculate about what this is going to do? Yeah. Yeah, it's gonna change the string to uppercase. Now, I just wanna make one point here about software engineering. Why were you, why were you both able to do this? I'm assuming you knew nothing about the different features and methods that a string provides when we started looking at this variable. Why were you able to do this? What helped you here? Yeah. They chose good function names, indeed, right? The person who created the string, uh, object in Java, like a person, somebody sat down and implemented this, someone made a choice about what to call these functions. They could have chosen to call this one foo. And they could have chosen to call this one bar. And that would have still worked. The computer doesn't care, right? But we would have never been able to do this exercise. So when you choose good function names, someone can look at your code and actually figure out a lot about what's happening without even having to understand it. Right. All right, so where do I find out about all these different goodies that the string class comes along with? Well, there's documentation, right? If you look up, just Google Java string, one of the top hits, hopefully the top hit, is going to be Java's official documentation about the string class. We'll look a lot at a lot more of this Java doc later. Now, okay, look. I, I cannot apologize on behalf of Java doc. Okay? I know that those of you that were born into the future may look at this and shudder a little bit, um, because most of the web pages that you look at are happily better designed for readability, okay? However, there is actually a lot of useful information here, um, and you will need to spend some time, particularly as you work on some of the homework problems and prepare for some of the quizzes, looking through some of this. Um, you don't necessarily have to read all of it, uh, it's probably not, you know, there's not a huge amount of text here. Um, but down here, there's a section called Method Summary. And starting here, as we go down, what we're gonna see is that there's a description of a bunch of different methods that I can call on a string object. One of them is the one that we just talked about. Okay, so here it is. Replace. And the documentation says it returns a string resulting from replacing all occurrences of old care in this string with new care. So it did what we thought. There is also a little bit farther down to uppercase. Converts all of the characters in this string to uppercase using the rules of the default locale. So that's interesting. Who can explain that to me? Why is this here? There's a little bit of latent I don't know, like US, US Western world centrism here. Why is this here? Yeah. Yeah, there's like, are there, I don't think there are capital letters in Chinese or, you know, some of, a lot of, and I would suspect a lot of languages in the world don't necessarily have the notion of case. And so, if you call to uppercase normally, we'll use the default rules that came with your version of Java. Uh, but in some parts of the world, this doesn't even make sense, or with working with certain types of, of string data. All right, so let's test out a hypothesis from before. So we thought that replace was going to take all of 
the T's and replace them with B's. We confirm that by looking at the documentation, and indeed, what we get back, what's printed, when I start with test, is B E S B. I've replaced all the T's with B's. Okay, great. And then at the bottom, uh, what's printed is uh, capital test. Now, one thing I want you to notice about this. So, who can point out something interesting about about this code? Yeah. Yeah, so the cha when I change things from T to B, then I print off example again to uppercase, and it's still test. So the reason for this is whenever you modify a string in Java, you don't, it doesn't modify the string inside, it doesn't modify the contents of example. What it does is it returns a new string with the changes that you requested. So let me try to, let's, let's make this more clear, right? So we'll say string, second is equal to example dot replace, and then I'm gonna print example, and second, oh, there it is. Okay, good. Yeah, so now you can see I've created a new variable called second that, res that is the, where the contents are the result of taking example and replacing all the t's with b's, and then I print example and second. Example is not changed. Example is still what I, uh, initialized it to be. So these functions, and this is true of pretty much all of the methods on the string class, they don't modify the string. They, they return a new string that has whatever modifications you request. Okay, so let's, yeah, you know what, I'm gonna just leave this bit of playground and let's go on and do an example. Well, so first I'll take some questions. So we're gonna do a little algorithm example in a minute. But questions about string. So this is, I, you know, I understand that this is, a, for some of you, particularly uh, for the beginners in the class, this is kind of a, an awkward moment, right? Because we're kind of like, we're stuck kind of halfway straddling the world of objects and the world of the variables that we've been talking about so far. And unfortunately in Java, that's kind of where strings are. Strings are in this awkward spot. Sort of, you can sort of pretend they're just normal primitive types, but you're confronted with the fact that they're objects in a couple of important ways. Questions about, about strings before we go on and do an example? Someone is pointing over here, is there a question over? Yeah, yeah, what's up? Mm-hmm. Ah, okay, so the question is, when I, when I um, print example.length, it prints four and aren't we indexing at zero? So when we index in an array, we start at zero. But we don't lie about the length of things, right? So the length of string is four. But we'll do an example in a minute where the first character in the string is a position zero. The second one is a position one, the third one is a position two, the fourth one is a position three. So length will always return the actual number of characters or integers or whatever that's stored inside an array, or in this case, a string. Just as a, you know, hypothesis, how do you think a string stores the data inside of it? Any guesses? Yeah. An array of characters. And so maybe that has some, maybe that's connected to the fact that a string will never change its contents, right? Because I can't change the length of an array. I could change the contents if I wanted to in certain cases, but in general I can't do it. So I just give you a new string with modified contents. Okay, let's do an example. So we're gonna solve a little problem here. We're gonna use strings. Um, did Ben do this on Monday? Was this one of our examples? I can't remember. I think we, I think in the past we did a version of this with characters. So now we're gonna use a string. And here's what I wanna do. I want to write, first we're gonna write a snippet, and then we're gonna uh, uh, encapsulate in a function. But the thing, the algorithm that I want to implement is, I want to find all cases in a string where there are two characters that are the same side by side. So two characters in the string, two consecutive characters are the same. All right, so who can walk me through, in English, at a high level, an algorithm for solving this problem? So let's think about how we're gonna solve it first. Not particularly hard, but let's come up with our approach and then we'll figure out how to get it down in code. Who can explain to me an algorithm for solving this problem? 
Don't worry about what a string can and can't do yet. We'll figure out that in a minute. Yeah. Mm hmm. Yeah, so I, I'm going to go through each. So, so let's, let's, let's think this through. So I'm going to go through every character in the string. OK, so I need a way to do that, right? So sometimes when you're solving problems like this, you know, and, and in fact, let's do this, right? OK, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to examine every character in the string. I'm going to compare it with the next value. I'll print out if they're the same, all right? So let's just put some notes here about what I need to do. So I'm going to examine every character in the string. What do I need to do here? Let's just figure out how to get this to work first, and then we'll make things a little bit more complicated. What programming construct that we've already talked about do I need to use here? Yeah. I need some kind of loop. Yeah. Let's try a for loop. Um, so I'm gonna start my index at i. I'm gonna increment it by one every time, but here, what do I need to put here? Remember, this is not an array, it's a string. With an array, what do I put here? If I want to go through every, let's say this was an array of characters, right? What would I put here? Yeah, so if I had a, essentially I wanted to go through every character in the string, so I want to go through every character, and to do that I'm going to walk i up until it's less than, as long, I'm going to continue as long as i is less than the length of the string. So if this was, and I, I promise you, you guys are going to make this mistake, that's okay. So the first thing I'm just going to do is make sure that my indices are working properly, okay? So who can tell me what's wrong with this? Let's run it and see what happens, actually. That's what I would do if I were you. Uh oh, okay. So it's, it's saying something's wrong on, um, line four. That's the, that's my for loop. It's saying it can't find this length symbol. Okay, what am I doing wrong? Yeah. Yeah, for a, so for a string, length is a method, not a property. This will make more sense when we talk about objects for now. Just remember that there's a difference here, okay? All right, good. So now it looks like I'm doing the right thing. Mississippi has how many? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven letters. And I see indices zero through ten. Okay, so I'm on the right track. Now, what do I need to be able to do? If I want to compare every character, what do I need to be able to do? So now my indices are working properly. Yeah. Find the character, I'm gonna modify your answer. Find the character at that index, okay? So now, this is when I would, I would dive back into the documentation here, okay? Um, and I would start scrolling around, and sometimes you can just kinda look through. I see equals here that I used before, okay, that's nice. Um, okay, actually, wait, I think we already went by it. Oh yeah, look at that, it's the first one. Care at. So this is a method. It takes a variable of type int. I have a variable of type int. What's my variable of type int? I. And it returns the care value at the specified index. So that sounds promising. So how am I gonna call this? I'm gonna call it by taking the name of my string variable, input, using my dot notation. So I put a dot there. Then I need the name of the method that I want to call, okay? So let's just try this for now. Ah, okay. So now I have another error, and now it's telling me again on line five, caret cannot be applied to nothing. It's saying it required an int. So whenever I call this caret function, I actually have to tell it what character in the string do I want to look at. In this case, that character is i. Okay, so I'm getting, I'm getting warm here. So now I know how to loop through the string, and I know how to extract a character at a particular position in the string, right? Okay, so now I'm really close. What do I need to do? 
So I, need, I, I know how to get the character at the current position. But my goal was to find places where that character and the character next to it were the same. So if, if I'm in a particular position in the string, let's say I'm at position i, where are my neighbors? i plus one, what's my other neighbor? i minus one. So, for example, index two has neighbors one and three. Now, I could actually use either here. I'm gonna use i plus one. So now, let's just do this. Let's say I'm gonna print off whether the character at position i is equal to the character position i plus one. We'll make this prettier in a minute. Is this going to work? Let's try it and see what happens. Oh, there's, it's, oh, yeah, I, I forgot to use my dot notation. There we go. Uh, now it's mad at me for something else. Ch uh, there we go. Okay, so now I've got another problem. And this is a different kind of error. You guys learned about these different kind of errors last week. What's gone wrong now? Why? I tried to get an index at 11. Why is that? Because if I have a character, if I have a string with 11 characters, how many pairs of characters are there? 10. So I need to modify this slightly. Okay. So now it says, for the first two characters, it's false. Second two characters, it's false. Third two characters, it's true. This looks right, but I actually would like to uh, make this prettier so I can actually see the characters that it thinks are identical. How do I do that? So I think my conditional is working properly. Or I think the, the comparison I'm doing is working properly. How do I, I only want to print off if the two characters are actually the same. So how do I do that? Yeah. Oh, I could do that, okay, yeah. So he's saying print the character plus the, pr th that would actually give me all the characters and whether or not they were equal. Here's what I'm gonna do instead. That's bit, that, was, that, that was actually a nice idea. I'm only going to print out the character if my algorithm has decided that it's equal. Okay, so this looks right, S is the character that's repeated in Mississippi. There's a second S that's repeated, and there's a P that's repeated. Let's try some things here. Let's make sure, so now we're gonna start thinking adversarially about our code. We're almost done. We're gonna find some cases where we think it might not work. So one special case might be if the repeated character is right at the beginning. Okay, it seems to work there. Another case that we might miss is if the character is right at the end seems to work there. And if I was really writing this, I'd probably write uh, some other tests. For example, does it get an empty string? It shouldn't do anything. What about a string that only has one repeated character? Okay. All right. We will work on this next time. I'm gonna, so here's what I'm gonna do from now on. I'm gonna run as long as I can until the people behind me start to get nervous. And as you guys are packing up, I'm just gonna put up this slide. So read the announcements. I don't need to yell them to you as you guys are leaving. Uh, we'll also keep posting announcements on the forum periodically. I will see you all on Friday.